Uh, hi. So I'm uh, Ryan Petrich, at rpetrich on uh, Twitter. Um, so I've been building tweaks uh, since, I guess, when uh, iPhone OS, it was called that at one point, uh, when iPhone OS 2.0 uh, came out. Um, so that was a while ago. Uh, and I've built a number of things since then. Uh, some successful tweaks, uh, some not so successful. Uh, sorry, one second. I'm just going to get my slide notes here. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, how do you define success? Uh, there's a number of different ways. Uh, you really have to figure out your goals for the project. Uh, do you want to get access to millions of devices? Have a whole bunch of people running your software? Uh, are you trying to learn about iOS or software engineering? Or just about the market? You know, you can kind of approach it that way. Uh, do you have frustration with how something works? Um, that's, for me, that's a big thing. Uh, I've got my iOS device, uh, and I love it, but I don't quite love every single thing about it. There's little things that uh, could be better. There's big things that could be better. Uh, there's new things that I want to do with my device. Uh, is it monetary? Um, a lot of people uh, build tweaks. Uh, as their job. It's their sometimes full-time, sometimes part-time. Uh, some of them have great success uh, in a monetary fashion. Um, and some people are just having fun building stuff, freebies, uh, little tweaks, things that they're excited about. Um, and then, of course, there's ego inflation. <laughs> there's, a, there's a great community. People uh, give us great support. Um, and it's really fun to just interact with people and you know, see what they're interested about. Um, that's a big part of jailbreaking. So I'm going to kind of explore a little bit more on the commercial side, um, just sort of like what it takes to make a successful commercial tweak. Uh, this might be something that you're releasing through the City Store, uh, or it might be something that you're doing, uh, you know, with sort of an ad ad revenue supported thing. Um, or I mean, there's there's other avenues, but those are kind of the the two main ones. So the first thing is try a bunch of ideas. Just as many ideas as you can. Um, most of them are going to be bad. Most of them are going to be horrible. Uh, and I've actually released a couple of, couple of uh, what I would describe as horrible, horrible ideas. Uh, but um, the, the key thing here is try as many things as possible because um, some of your ideas are going to be good. Uh, and they're not necessarily the ones that you think are going to be good. Um, often it's a small, simple idea. I, I think I should, should I turn this off? Was that not, okay, here. Let's, okay, here, let's, oh, there's another one, okay. Let's go, hold. Okay, where's the where's the vibration oh, setting? <laughs> What's here? Why don't I just give this to Craig? Here, you, you take this. I'm not allowed a phone anymore, apparently. Um, uh, so yeah, try a bunch of ideas. Um, often, simple ideas that are really easy to explain um, are good ones. Uh, often things that are platforms that people can build on. Um, and then just like things that really work, you know, um, just as it's just something you come up with a shower, just like give it a try. Make a mock. Um, maybe experiment in script. Uh, maybe just kind of like build just the basic version of what you want to do um, and just see like is this feasible? Is it useful? Um, try it out. And uh, if, if it's useful, hey, pursue it. If not, you didn't spend too much time on it. Um, but the real important thing is to getting to something useful, something that makes using your device a better experience, uh, provides something you couldn't do before, makes something you could do before better, or improves something that just annoys you. 
get something that's useful uh, for yourself first. Um, and I know build something useful seems kind of obvious, but there's actually a lot of things on Cydia that are just not entirely useful. Um, and again, I, I've built some of them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you build something that you find useful, that's going to guarantee that you have at least one user. Um, some of the things that I've built don't have uh, probably a single user. Um, but yeah, if you build for yourself and you use it and you love the thing that you're using, uh, that guarantees that there's going to be one user, someone that loves it, and it's going to mean that that project sticks with you. You won't get bored of it. You'll continue working on it. Uh, the next thing is try different versions of your idea. Uh, the first design is not necessarily the best. Um, and this is something you can do uh, via mockups. You know, you sketch it out, try it, and see, does this look like it's going to work? Um, and that's a really cheap way to just get through like seven or eight or nine or 12 or I don't know how many revisions some designers in the room do, but uh, I'm a developer, an engineer type, uh, and I end up going through at least a dozen versions of each design uh, for major things uh, before something goes public. Um, so mockups are pretty simple. Um, you can do experiments in script or in logos. Uh, that's a little more difficult, it takes a little more effort, um, but especially if you come to learn and love script, uh, you can get these mockups actually out uh, pretty easy, especially if they're for simple ideas. You can move things around, adjust things at the pixel level, um, you know, add event handlers, stuff like that. There's crazy things you can do with script that makes mocking things up a lot quicker and faster. Uh, for full versions are a little bit more expensive in terms of how much time you put into it. Uh, but sometimes it's really necessary, especially when you want to get the perfect interaction model, uh, the perfect layout. Uh, try it out. Build it. It doesn't have to be bug-free. Get it on your phone and run it for a week and see, do you like it? Does it work for you? Because if it doesn't work for you, that it's not going to work for everyone else. So, you know, try a few of those. Um, if this, then that for Activator. Uh, I've prototyped that four times so far and have not found a version I like. So that, that's been around as an idea for maybe two years. Uh, and I'm still working on it. So you know, get something that is good. Um, and try it in front of real people. Yes, people. Uh, people who aren't engineers. Um, because the people who use Cydia, some of them are engineers, but most of them are not. Uh, it's a very diverse community of people who are excited about themes and tweaks and customizing their device and just getting out of the box that normally iOS devices are trapped in. Uh, so don't assume that people are like you. Um, and just go and see how they use it. Uh, do they find it simple? Do they find it complicated? Um, do they, sometimes you even get extensions of your, your idea. Your, your product. They're like, oh, I'd, I'd be really interested if it did this. And that's something you hadn't thought of. So get their feedback. It's really great. Um, friends and family are a good start. Uh, strangers are more honest. So if you can talk to a stranger uh, in a nice way, um, yeah, they, they will help you. And they will tell you sometimes things that are very uh, difficult to hear. But it's good feedback. Um, I've, I've even gone, and I've done this before, I've just, you know, kind of bumped into someone at Starbucks and just bought their coffee for them and said, hey, can you take like two minutes and try this app out? Uh, people love apps. They're, they're like crazy, like, oh, smartphones are great. Um, so people are surprisingly willing to do that. Not everyone's going to say yes, uh, but yeah, if you can just ask someone at a Starbucks, pay for their coffee uh, or their donut or whatever, um, and that, that, that works. Um, so this goes back to the previous uh, idea. Get the core feature set perfect. It's important that the basic thing that your product does, does it well. So the, the core thing, if you had to describe your product in you know, 20 words or whatever it is, that thing should be correct and perfect. Uh, 
regardless of how many features it has. I know we looked at uh, Spring to Mize <laughs> earlier. The, there's, a, there's a, I don't know if that quite applies to Spring to Mize, but most packages in Cydia uh, have one core feature, one core idea. Get that right. Um, the core features should be enabled out of the box by default upon installation. Uh, uh, defaults should be the most common configuration. So uh, when someone installs your tweak, they get the best experience. You, they just go Cydia, type, type it in, press install, comes up. The good settings by default are enabled. They don't have to do anything else. They don't have to look for your icon in settings. They just get a really good experience right out of the box. Um, in fact, imagine that uh, you're designing for a user who doesn't know that the setting app exists. Uh, I know that's a bit rare for people who are jailbreaking and using Cydia, uh, but it's a good rule of thumb to follow. Uh, once you've got the core feature set, add limited customizability, uh, especially for the first release. Um, there's the assumption that uh, because jailbreakers love customizing their devices, uh, that every possible thing you could put in your tweak uh, or your product uh, should be there. Uh, figure out options that make sense. They're going to actually be useful. Uh, don't provide subtle variations of the same option twice um, because you're better off just picking the better version and going with that and offering that as an option. Um, bare minimum for a tweak is an on-off switch. Uh, if you don't have an on-off switch, people are going to be installing and uninstalling your tweak and they're going to get frustrated. Uh, and reviewers pretty much require it nowadays. So be sure you at least have that. Uh, test with everything. Um, you want to have a good impression of the gate. Uh, so make sure that your package works on iPhone and iPad. Uh, the iPad market is a little bit smaller, but there's also fewer packages in Cydia that support the iPad. So if you're supporting the iPad right out the gate, someone can go and you know, they, they hear about your tweak in the big you know, week after your release uh, where you've got buzz, you've got press, people are mentioning your, your tweak in blogs, um, and they want to install it, but they only have an iPad. Uh, that's your opportunity to get them as a customer. Um, so make sure your package works. Um, so test on all device classes. Uh, retina and non-retina. There are still non-retina iPads. Uh, it's not that difficult. You just need to add a, you know, an extra image for each image that you have um, and make sure that things kind of line up properly. It's not difficult to do. Go do it. Uh, I recommend testing on the latest two iOS versions. There's sometimes people who are held back a little bit. Uh, some people still love iOS 6. So they still have money, and they still want to be installing things in Cydia. Um, you know, let them have, have your, your, your package, your product. Let them use it. Um, it's, not actually that, it's not actually that difficult to test uh, on iOS 6. Um, I released a new package earlier in the year. It required a grand total of six lines of code to add iOS 6 support. Uh, and that's in something that was maybe, I don't have the number offhand, but maybe 12,000, 9,000 lines of code. So it's not a lot. It's just a little effort. You just got to run it on the device and test it. Um, it's not that difficult. Uh, slower devices. And make sure you test with common packages, Winterboard, Activator, Byte SMS, OXO, Lock Info. Um, just you know, if someone installs your package and it crashes because you didn't test with these very, very frequently installed packages, it, it, it leaves a bad taste in their mouths. Uh, brand your work. Uh, naming is important. Uh, Sebastian talked about this yesterday. Uh, pick something that's memorable, easy to type, that's relevant to your package. Uh, if you can pick a playful name, uh, that, that's often good uh, because it kind of puts your package in sort of a happy, upbeat vibe. Um, similarly, you want a good icon. Uh, free tweaks generally don't need an icon, but it's better if they do have one. Um, should be memorable and relevant, just like your name. 
Uh, and the point of an icon is that it's iconic. It should be very bold and memorable. You should know, oh, okay, you see this icon, have an instant association uh, with your product. Uh, short description, Insidia. Uh, this is the line that goes under your package name uh, when people see it in the changes screen or when they see it in search. Uh, so you've got a limited number of characters. Uh, I like to think of it as an elevator pitch in a really, really short elevator. You've got a limited number of words. Uh, use them wisely. There's your depiction, which is the, uh, when you tap the package in Cydia, uh it shows a, a longer display of what uh, your package is about. Uh, you should have a good description in there. Uh, it should describe your tweak precisely um, in a paragraph or two. Uh, verbosity is harmful, and make sure you provide screenshots. Uh, website, oddly enough, websites are kind of optional. Uh, most people find packages through Cydia uh, itself or through blogs and YouTube and stuff like that. Um, some people have more success with websites than I do, uh, and they'd probably tell me that it isn't optional, but <laughs> uh, I just find in general uh, people access packages through other mediums. Um, then get people excited. You know, you're, you're building something new. You're excited about your, your product. Um, get other people involved. Show previews, uh, Twitter, Reddit, ModMyEye, other forums. Uh, very important uh, to show previews. Um, you can be a little bit of a tease. I know the A3 tweaks people, uh, they like to take sort of like an angled screenshot where you're looking at it. Um, and that's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, people get that little buzz and they're, they're thinking about it. Um, and then contact bloggers directly. Bloggers, YouTubes, uh, you know, Sebastian's talked about this quite a bit. Uh, but it's really important. Uh, the bloggers are on your side. They might be a little harsh sometimes, but, you know, uh, they're really excited about Cydia and some of them make it their full-time jobs to just talk about Cydia stuff. So they're, they're very excited about the stuff that you're working on. Uh, then you need to fire the missiles. Uh, so that means submitting it to a repo, usually on my eye or Big Boss. Uh, work with the package manager. Uh, they will have good feedback for you. Uh, they see thousands of packages uh, and they're in the best position to tell you if something is kind of really out of place. Um, and if you do have a website, this is where you'd put your website live. Uh, Media Blitz, uh, announce on Twitter and Reddit. Uh, critical mass of the community is on Twitter. Again, bloggers, YouTubes, send review copies to anyone who asks. Just don't verify their credentials. They ask for it, just send it to them. It's fine. It's, you know, easy to do. Uh, and if they mention you, that's, that's great, because someone's going to see it, and even if it's not necessarily favorable review, uh, they'll at least have exposure to your product. Answer their questions, follow them on Twitter. Uh, then there's the follow through. Uh, you've got email, lots of email, uh, Twitter, Reddit, forums. Uh, reach out to people having trouble, especially in the, the early release. Uh, you know, you've got one opportunity to make a good impression on people. Uh, get things, if, there, if there's any bug fixes that need to happen right away. Uh, jump on it really quickly. Um, and then start working on the next, next version. Uh, bug fixes, new features, uh, maybe you know there's an iOS update coming up. Uh, sometimes it's just sort of cleaning up some of the things that you, know, you kind of papered over uh, to make your release date. Um, and that is the general path you'd want to take uh, when releasing a, a new product. Uh, Craig, how am I doing for time? Two minutes. Oh, okay. I'm halfway done. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my second topic, uh, I want to talk a little bit about JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript is the most used language on the planet. Uh, straightforward syntax. It is well documented. Uh, and it's pretty easy to get started. You can't really use JavaScript uh, to build tweaks. So I'd like to introduce a new way to build tweaks uh, using JavaScript. 
Any of you who have been in the advanced presentation with Jay uh, got to see him demo script and all of the fancy things it can do. Uh, script is a dialect of JavaScript uh, that allows you to do runtime introspection and have a lot of fun. Um, so I'm introducing a, a new kind of sub-variant of script uh, called Six. Um, Six is a hook transpiler for script. Uh, it allows you to write JavaScript. It allows you to write uh, hooks similar to you would write in Logos uh, inside of a JavaScript file and deploy it to your device. Um, so here I'm going to demo. Uh, oh, Six is based on Logos. So those of you who know Logos and use it already, uh, very, very similar to that. So here is a Logos uh, example hook uh, in, uh, it, it written in Logos. It hooks the description on UI view and adds some extra text on the end. So if someone logs your, your description, you, you get some extra text. So this is how you do it in Logos. Pretty straightforward. You've got your class there, UI view. Uh, you've got the method you're hooking, description. Uh, and you've got uh, the new code, which adds some extra text to the end. Uh, here it is in six. Really straightforward. Similar structure, uh, but we're using JavaScript string concatenation, uh, a normal JavaScript string. Uh, and it works very similar to Logos, but you can use all of the, the fun JavaScript stuff you're perhaps used to for developing for the web uh, or for Node or for something like that. Um, all the fancy JavaScript syntax, you can use all the script syntax uh, that has been demoed earlier uh, yesterday, and uh, now new logo style hook syntax. Uh, so with that, uh, we also need a way to compile our new six scripts. Uh, and I am extending my logos fork uh, to have six support baked in. Uh, so it's getting even more forky. Uh, it's, it's diverging off the path a little bit more, which I'm sure Dustin will love me for. Um, <laughs> uh, so here's your, your standard make file of a tweak, and uh, those of you who can't see the text in the back, that's fine. Um, here is the example for a six tweak. Uh, you've got the name of the tweak, and then you just drop your example dot six in there, and uh, when you make a package, it'll include the compiled version of your six tweak, um, and it'll be ready to deploy on your device. Um, so with that, a new loader is needed. Uh, so I'm introducing Sloader as well. Uh, it's a loader for script scripts. Uh, feels weird saying script scripts. Uh, and uh, contrary to how you might pronounce the name, it's not actually any slower than anything. It's just called Sloader. Um, yeah? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, exactly like mobile loader. Uh, works with JavaScript tweaks, uh, works with safe mode, so any of the standard behaviors that uh, users are expecting uh, when they use mobile substrate tweaks uh, will be preserved when you use loader tweaks. Uh, so uh, someone can go into Cydia, they've got your, your, your six tweak, uh, they install it, they don't even know that it's using JavaScript instead of Objective-C. They just go get your tweak, they install it, everything is like normal, looks exactly the same. Uh, so I'm aiming for a full release uh, late April. I was hoping to have it up uh, before JailbreakCon, uh, but I wasn't able to finish it. Um, so beta up even sooner, uh, and I hope we'll be able to get even more people writing tweaks and building cool things. Uh, I'm at Arpetrich. Uh, you can get my slides at that URL up there, uh, which I will be tweeting shortly. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to JailbreakCon. So I actually do have a question. So the reason why script doesn't currently do these features isn't because I didn't want to build it, but because I haven't finalized um, the memory management aspects nor yes. the API interfaces for things. So I'm not in a position to really have people be building and deploying things on script that are not going to get broken very quickly. 
Uh, I actually was laying the groundwork for a lot of these things with the substrate integration of script in 0.9.500, but I've been meaning to now get around to deprecating most of the old ways of doing the like bindings for everything as I move towards all the typecasts and new features. So I'm wondering how, and I, like how this is going to work with people now deploying things with this framework when it's like, I mean, I think you know that these things are about to be deprecated, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, that's why we're doing a, a, a beta shortly. Uh, I hope to work with you to get all of the APIs finalized. Um, and uh, it, I, I think it's really important uh, to get more people going and building tweaks. I think the 64-bit uh, transition was a bit rocky for people. Uh, and so having things being built in a managed language is really important for me. Um, so my intention is to have the, the compiler produce things that uh, aren't going to change, uh, and, and that's what it does currently. Uh, the thing that I told you yesterday that would work with doing the functor binding, I consider to be something that's going to change. Oh, that's going to change? Yeah, I don't, okay. I, I, all, all of the stuff that, that like, because I, I only consider script to be something that is, that is a, a REPL environment currently. I've been, I've been working on trying to finalize how all of the actual, like, programming APIs are going through it to build this. <laughs> uh, which, by the way, is going to be integrated as syntax into the grammar as opposed to being a preprocessor pre in a build environment. Because what I want you to be able to do is just drop script files into a folder and have them get loaded into processes in the same way that a substrate dilib is. So you don't need to, so that way you don't even need a build environment. You don't need a computer. You don't need make or Perl or any of these other things. You can just drop the script files into a, a, a loader folder. Um, and then that, and they, so that's, yeah. It just, it just seems like this is a very indirect way of accomplishing something that's going to break very quickly and, 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 and at the same time kind of ties my hands towards building something else unless I knowingly break things now that are going to get deployed with this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where the question came as yeah. part of that. The, the, quest, the, question, the question was, is, 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 I, I'm, is like, how do you expect this to, to work with the fact that it's, things are going to break. That's that. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> I guess Let, it's lunchtime. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think this is something we should def like we can definitely talk about off offline. But I mean, at, at like, lunch, maybe? it's oh, at lunch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, having having a production use case for script uh, is a really good uh, mover in terms of getting. APIs that are that are solid and, and well defined. So, um, if we want to push the you know the the release date off, that's that's certainly fine. Uh, I, I'd be happy to do that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Here's your phone, Ryan. By the way. Okay. So everybody, um, lunch is served um, to the room parallel to us right here. And come back at one thirty, please. Thank you.